Hi there, everyone. I'm glad you could join me on this beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, at least it's beautiful here in Naples, Florida. Uh, I can show you what the weather is like out here, out in my garage. It's about 80 degrees and sunny here in Naples. I hope you guys up in the Northeast are putting up with your bad weather. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of submarine talk here. I'm going to give you an update on uh, some of the projects that I've got going on. I'm going to do that to, for the next little while just so that we don't miss anybody when we start getting into the technical discussions. There's two things uh, I really wanted to touch on uh, during this session uh, and we'll wrap it up. We won't go quite as long as we did last time. Uh, so maybe there's three things. Three things. Uh, some projects that I've got going on. I'll give you an update. Uh, I want to touch on 3D printing because this is a big deal and it's becoming up uh, more and more commonly in the forums because people are really interested in it as a modeling tool and a way to um, produce parts and potentially hulls um, rather easily and very accurately. So the third thing that I want to touch on is adhesives, uh, glues, because there's a lot of different uh, glues that you can utilize. And uh, I want to go in when you might want to use each one uh, when it's appropriate and some uh, tips about the ones that I like to use the most. So again, thanks for joining me. Let's talk about what I've got on the bench uh, right now. Let's start with the, uh, the big Type 21. Uh, as you can see, it's now in... Um, one piece, if you were following <clears throat> my, uh, my stream uh, earlier, you'll see that I chopped it and you can see the seams uh, here. It's just a razor blade thickness uh, right there. And then if we move up into the front, uh, man, that one's, even, that one's even tighter, as you can see. Now, the reason for this is obviously because this is a massive boat. This is 30th scale. You can see it takes up my entire workbench. Um, but so we wanted to bust it into sections and uh, the way that I accomplished that is through the use of uh, these brackets that you can see in there. Those are big uh, aluminum brackets. I've got some stainless steel hardware uh, holding them together. These are wing nuts so you can just simply utilize your fingers to bolt the entire uh, front and rear section to the boat. And this is very similar to the Type 7 uh, that I put together, that big 30 second scale uh, type 7. There's obviously more room in here. It's a little bit easier to put it together. So pretty stoked about that. Um, you know, on that subject of 3D printing, I got some 3D printed uh, grating that's going to be installed in these sections here. Uh, these were printed on my little MakerBot, uh, the different sizes uh, and sections, uh, as you can see on the big blueprints there. So what I'm going to be moving on to next is uh, basically detailing out the hull. I'll be filling in all of the holes, getting the ballast crates, going to be applying some weld lines with some styrene plastic, sanding all of this down, and we will get it into primer. So super stoked about that. Uh, the other thing that I've got going on at the same time is another project, and this is uh, an OTW uh, upholder. Now, I built a few of these. And uh, I will be documenting this one from start to finish so you can follow along. Uh, the first video for that should be uploaded maybe by the end of this weekend. Uh, but as you can see here, this is the hull from uh, OTW. Just beautiful work, you know, absolutely gorgeous as usual. Um, with all of my builds, I like to start with the cylinder. Uh, and this is no exception. I've got a four and a quarter inch diameter. OTW dive module in here. We've got uh, six channel uh, VEX radio driving the whole thing. Nice big beefy single shaft uh, output uh, pump style system. There's all of our pumps, remote switch uh, and everything. So this is almost ready to go. Uh, the first chapter of my build will be up on my channel, like I said, hopefully by the end of the weekend. Um, that's really what I've got going on in terms of uh, build stuff right now. Obviously shipping out a lot of products. Thanks you all of my customers for everything that you do to keep this hobby uh, alive. Now, why don't we talk about glue since we're right here. Um, there's a few different kinds and uh, I'll go into each one um, and its application. 
one by one. Let's start uh, actually with, uh, with filler. There's two different kinds that uh, I typically utilize. Um, one is for the, you know, the big kind of gross uh, filling of seams that I use a lot, you know, for example, on that big one. And what I like to use is this uh, Rage by Evercoat. Uh, it's lightweight, doesn't clog up uh, sandpaper. Uh, I love it a lot. It's really easy to work with. It sands really, really well. So that's uh, Rage by Evercoat if you're looking for uh, a larger filler. The other filler that you're going to need to use uh, is for scratches and small um, uh, scratches and small gaps. Um, here we go. Someone asked me to rotate the device, so we're going to give that a shot and see if this works. I don't know if, if that is actually working or not. I don't know that it is, you know, I'm just going to put it back the way that it was. <laughs> All right, John, thanks a lot. Next time I'll stream in portrait. How's that sound? All right, guys, back to the uh, glue. Um, this is uh, basically putty. This is uh, a, an automotive grade um, filler by Nitrostan. Uh, it's a spot and glazing putty. Uh, you can order this online. I find this works really, really well. Um, acetone uh, is what you're going to utilize to uh, thin and clean this up. So those are your fillers, your two fillers. We've got uh, Nitrostan for the small stuff and we've got Evercoat Rage uh, for the bigger stuff. Uh, now we're going to talk about some uh, other adhesives. Um, Liquid styrene cement. Now, a lot of people like utilizing the, um, you know, the, the plastic model kits by like Ravel, for example, Trumpeter, uh, Bronco, and that kind of thing. This stuff works exceptionally well. So this actually welds the two pieces uh, together. It's not adding anything to it. It's actually uh, melting the plastic and fusing it together. Uh, it's liquid, like water, as you can see right there. Exceptionally easy to use. So I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a liquid styrene cement. Um, the other thing that uh, obviously we like to use in this hobby is uh, CA glue. And here's a few different versions uh, that I like to use. Um, thin CA for the, the detail pieces. Uh, this is like a water consistency. This is my, my, my favorite glue of all time. This is a rubber reinforced cyanoacrylate by Bob Smith Industries. There's a few different versions uh, out there, but it's basically black like tar uh, and it's thick and it's reinforced with rubber. So it's got some flexibility in it. Um, typically when an CA glue cures, it's very fragile um, and uh, can crack very easily. So this has just a little bit of flex uh, to it. This stuff here is absolutely my favorite glue uh, of all time, very versatile, a uh, Gorilla brand, brand uh, gel. So it's a, it's a gap filler. And the thing I love about it, when you hit it with some of this um, accelerator, it instantly kicks off. So um, this accelerator comes in these little spray bottles. Uh, I refill it from a big jug, but um, you give it just a mist and uh, it kicks off cyanoacrylate glue uh, almost instantly. Um, again, on that uh, theme of, of Gorilla, I love this original formula Gorilla Glue. Um, this kind of oxidizes with, uh, you know, with the air and it turns into a foam. And once that stuff uh, cures in place, uh, it's perfect for bonding like big bulkheads into your models. Uh, it, when it fuses, it's done. It is not going to move anywhere. So those are the, the other adhesives that uh, I like to use as well. Um, also for big, uh, adhesions, um, epoxy resin is something that I like to use, uh, a lot. Now, uh, for internal, uh, areas in the, in the dry hull of the boat, you can use like a five minute epoxy, which is really, really nice. Um, 
I see Kevin is talking there about uh, five minute epoxy. The thing about five minute epoxy, it's it's been found, and I haven't seen this myself, but it's been found that uh, prolonged exposure to water will actually soften uh, five minute epoxy. So you want something that'll cure in, in uh, 24 hours for maximum uh, longevity of your bonds. Now, when this uh, mixes up, it's kind of the consistency of, uh, you know, a little thinner than toothpaste. Um, you mix it one to one, uh, you know, in a jar. What you can do to thicken that up is, uh, is add um, what's called micro balloons. Um, make sure you use a mask uh, when you use it. You can see it's almost like flour. Uh, and these are just really, really tiny uh, beads, like microscopic beads. And that uh, can flesh out the mixture, make it a lot thicker. Uh, and you can add or subtract uh, the... Um, uh, micro balloons to make a thicker or thinner mixture depending on what your application is. So those are kind of the different adhesives uh, that I like to use. Uh, by far, I use this uh, this um, Gorilla brand super glue gel. Uh, it's the most versatile of the adhesives that uh, I use. So, um, I saw a question in there about uh, waterproofing batteries. Um, there's a few different ways of going about that. The easiest way, if you've got a big boat, like that upholder that I just showed you, that's a 150th scale, um, is to use a sealed lead acid battery. There's nothing wrong with them, even though that technology has been around for like forever. Um, I will be ordering a, um, a sealed lead acid battery, probably a five amp to seven amp version for that uh, model. And <coughs> uh, the good thing about them is they're sealed, which is why they're called sealed lead acid batteries. Uh, you just need to seal off the connector and you can just use, um, you know, standard uh, silicone RTV to isolate the uh, connectors. And really it's the positive terminal that's gonna end up corroding on you. And you'll see it, if you run it in the wet, um, it'll turn green, it'll bubble uh, a little bit. You, slather that with uh, RTV silicone, make sure that it's completely sealed off uh, and you'll be in good shape. Now, a lot of people don't have the room, you know, for that. Um, there's a few different things that you can do and that I have done uh, in the past. Uh, you can see I've got some big rolls of heat shrink here. These are clear uh, rolls of heat shrink. You can <clears throat> tuck your batteries uh, inside and then uh, heat it up. Uh, it'll suck down onto the uh, battery and then you can seal off the end with uh, with RTV and that's good for like nickel metal hydride batteries uh, for example this pack right here which is a big 5 amp uh, battery pack uh, that's what I would probably do to waterproof this particular one lithium polymer batteries I would not recommend running uh, in the wet uh, it's just not worth it they're a little bit too volatile um, the good news is they're typically very energy dense and they will uh, fit in a lot of places. There's a lot of different configurations of uh, lithium polymer batteries that you can put in everything from the little tiny uh, 850 milliamp batteries to the huge, you know, 6,500 milliamp uh, batteries. And you can tuck those in a lot of different places um, in your uh, watertight cylinders. Um, watertight connections. There's two different types of watertight connections uh, that I typically use. This is one that I really like. Amazon is like wonderful. I spend a bajillion dollars on Amazon. These are um, basically for uh, trailers. And uh, you can see that we've got, uh, you know, both ends there. Pops off really easily um, just by, I'm gonna try and do this one handed. You can see a, a yellow seal in there and that goes into the other side right there so that is perfect for battery uh, connections um, you can also get them I believe in three and four wire um, versions now if you have followed uh, some of my other uh, builds you'll have noticed that I've used a different kind of uh, connectors let's see if I can find an example in here <clears throat> well, they're in a package, so you're going to have a hard time seeing them. Uh, but these are circular um, connections. It's the same sort of idea. They're waterproof, uh, and they've got a threaded 
connection on the outside. So you basically press them together, uh, screw them down, and then they're 100% watertight. These are really, really good for uh, kind of peripheral things that are not high voltage like uh, lights or if you want to run extra uh, servo leads and that kind of thing. Because eventually if you use a standard connector, you know, like a Dean's connector uh, or that kind of thing, uh, you're going to get water corrosion in there and eventually your connection will fail. Uh, and it's a pain to replace all of that stuff. So um, those are like the waterproof connectors that uh, I typically end up using. Um, let's talk well, as I move here. Well, actually, you know, I'm going to show you some cool stuff that I have. If you check my, my website out, um, you'll see I, I just loaded up uh, a whole bunch of this stuff in my bargain bin. Uh, got some watertight cylinders. Two of these are sold right now, but what's left uh, is certainly up there. Got a little waterproof uh, video camera. I've used these in the past. These are perfect for uh, just sticking to your boat and filming in high definition uh, video. Got some chargers and bulkheads. Uh, I've got some radios up there, some 75 megahertz radios. I got a bunch of 2.4 gigahertz radios. These are great for dynamic uh, divers because you can extend the antenna up through your periscope and you can actually run at periscope depth um, with these radio systems. So check out the bargain bin section uh, of my website. I haven't listed these, but if you're looking for one uh, and you love scratch building your own cylinders, these are watertight bulkheads. Um, you know, they got the the drive bushings and seals already in place. So let me know what you're looking for. Uh, I can probably hook you up. Um, as I walk into the next room before we seg into 3D printing, wanted to, uh, there was a question there about Nautilus models. Um, you guys know that the Nautilus is like my favorite model of all time. Uh, Harper Goff did an amazing job designing that iconic boat. Um, really there's been, um, in terms of practical RC application, uh, models, just, uh, a couple. There's been a 31 inch offering from Scott Brodine, uh, which I carry. Now Scott's had some health issues, but we're working on getting the production back into place. So we'll look for that <clears throat> in the very near future. Um, I've put a um, uh, blog up on my website talking about uh, Lee Sealer and total immersions. Um, steer clear of those boats. That's just my recommendation. Uh, the quality is poor and it's a blatant knockoff of Scott Brodine's kit. He basically took Scott's kit, stripped it down, and then uh, applied new details and called it his own. So that's, that's kind of a shitty thing to do. I'm sorry. So 31 inch boat. I've got lots and lots of videos on my website on converting those to nice size, a little small for my tastes. The other one out there is the big custom replica 66 inch boat out of production. It is not going to be around for you guys anymore. If you've got one, yay for you. If you do not, um, you are out of luck. Uh, I managed just recently and I'll go show this to you uh, to get back a hold of a kit of that 66 inch Nautilus that I had built previously for a customer who ended up trading it back into me. Uh, and this is it right here. So uh, again, 66 and a half inches is a really nice size. Uh, got fully operational breather flaps on this particular boat, photo etched grating, uh, tilting propeller assembly in the back. So that's gonna be my personal boat no, you can't have it. Forget it. Um, quick question I can see from Michelle there. Uh, depth, the answer I always love to give, down to the bottom. They'll all go down to the bottom. It's getting them back up again. That's the challenge. Typically, in pure fresh water, you could go 20, 30 feet with the proper cylinder. Um, I've taken our subdriver units down to that depth without any problems. Um, what you'll run into though is in uh, area, bodies of water with contaminants such as chemicals uh, or biological um, contaminants like algae, you're going to get your depth reduced significantly. Typically operation, 
uh, you're gonna be at periscope depth, two feet, maybe three feet. Anything deeper, uh, you are going to lose uh, sight of where it's at and potentially lose your boat. So not really recommended to go much deeper than that, even though you can. Um, back on the subject of Nautilus really quick, the other boat that's out there that is exceptionally rare um, originated with the EFX Nautilus. It's a 48 inch Nautilus. That particular boat is going to be offered through the Nautilus dry docks very shortly. Four foot long Nautilus. It's a beautiful size, obviously between the 31 and the 66 inch. Ideal for RC operation. Watch for that coming uh, in the next few months. That was originally mastered by Scott Brodine. He did an amazing job. It is a beautiful boat. Um, trust me, you're going to want to grab one once it is released. 3D printing. Again, like I said, this is a big topic uh, for people that are really interested uh, in it. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with it, it can kind of seem like magic. You know, hit a few keystrokes, hit print, and all of a sudden, uh, out from your printer spits a plastic part that looks exactly like what you need it to. There's a few different aspects uh, to this. Now, now is a great time to be getting into this hobby uh, because of the applications and hardware that is available uh, for so cheap. Um, this application that you can see on the screen right now is a, a free application from Google uh, in collaboration with Trimble, which is a uh, 3D um, drafting program called SketchUp. It's exceptionally easy to use. I use it 99% of the time. Uh, this is a World War II German snorkel intake that I drafted really quick for, uh, actually for the Big 20, Type 21 uh, build. So the first thing you've got to realize is that 3D printing is never going to replace fabrication by hand um, completely. You'll always be able to build um, almost anything that you could print with your hands, but it takes more time. Uh, and energy to do so. Printing in 3D allows you to create parts that sometimes are impossible to build by hand uh, but are um, repeatable and can be printed in a variety of metals and uh, plastics. So the printer that you've got uh, going right here, this is my MakerBot Z18. You can see it's got a pretty massive uh, build volume in there. I think I got like 20 inches uh, of build volume. Um, what I'm printing right now is actually the back end of a um, British X-Craft. And this is the application that's utilized to uh, interface with the printer and print it out. So I drafted this rear section in 3D and printed it out. <laughs> that's one section right there. And, uh, and this is another that's completed. So this is a finished 3D part. You can see it's sizable. Um, this is a big chunk. Um, it's at medium resolution, uh, a little bit of primer and you'll be in good shape. Um, I saw a comment in there about PLA and water. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, take it with a grain of salt, dude. We're gonna be keeping these boats in the water for like, 20 minutes and then we haul it out and then it's going to spend weeks out of the water. So really the time that that plastic is going to have to interact with the water is exceptionally small. If you're going to keep it in a fish tank for like a year, I would worry about it. But otherwise, this is a perfectly acceptable product uh, to be utilizing in the water. 3D printers can also print in other plastics. That's a, this is a PLA plastic. It's a corn based product. As it prints, it smells like popcorn. It's pretty cool actually. Um, you can also print in like uh, high impact polystyrene. You can also talk uh, about printing in ABS. You love that chemical smell, but it has a lot of strength properties that people like. Um, so yeah, these are two printers uh, that I have. This is my original one. It's an old uh, Replicator 2. This thing is like bulletproof. I've got thousands of hours of prints on this and it is still going strong. You can see I've got another batch of uh, grates for the Type 21 that I just knocked out on there. This is good uh, for you know large part uh, prototyping. It's more commercial grade, so you can pause prints in the middle, uh, swap out filament and all of that kind of stuff. So just to back up again, 
lots of printers uh, out there for a really, really good price. Uh, you can get them as low as like 100 bucks. Uh, decent one, you're going to be spending seven, eight, nine hundred, or a thousand dollars or more to um, get a high quality printer. But really, you know, again, uh, in my mind, that kind of an investment is is pretty good. So if we think about this, the file that I created uh, to um, make this particular piece took me maybe three or four hours uh, to draft. I could go, you know, in much more detail, but I'll be finishing it out by hand. Um, and then the good news is I just pop it on the printer and walk away. Um, it's going to take maybe 24 hours total to print out the entire part. But in the meantime, I'm doing other stuff. Uh, and that's kind of the cool thing about it. So you think about a, a big piece like that, that's like 16 or 18 inches long, uh, has to fit to very uh, specific um, parameters in terms of size and, and dimensions and specifications. To do that all by hand would take a long time. Um, but to do it digitally uh, and just hit print, um, again, saves you a ton of time. Uh, asking about the 21, yeah, you missed it, dude. Um, <laughs> I'll have some more pictures and video up uh, on that project. And um, you guys can take a look at, at more updates on that uh, very soon. Um, any other questions that you guys might have about 3D printing? I've seen some people chiming in there on their uh, own personal experience with uh, 3D printing. One thing that I will say, um, you get people like uh, the illustrious David Merriman III and, and some other people, true craftsmen that can do amazing things, you know, with their hands. Um, what we're talking about here is, is the death of, a, of the traditional craftsmen. Uh, Eventually, I have no doubt that every household will have a 3D printer um, and it'll be printing in multiple different materials. Uh, if you want a you know, new set of hardware for your cabinets, you'll just browse the internet, download the one you want, hit print, and a few hours later you'll have your all new hardware. Um, it's coming. So uh, we can embrace it or we can uh, you know, live in the past. Um, I do both, you know, I'll fabricate things by hand when it makes sense. I'll utilize 3d printing, uh, and other modern technologies when it makes sense. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is if you don't want to make that investment in a 3d printer, there are services out there that'll do it for you. Um, one, for example, that I like to use, uh, is Shapeways. Um, you can browse other people's products in this, uh, or you can upload your own and have them printed for you. And you can get them printed in uh, in nylon, you can get them printed in uh, detail plastic, you can get it printed in metal. It's very cool, they're quick, uh, it's very cost effective. 3D Hubs is another great um, platform out there that basically allows you to shop 3D printing services from around the globe. Uh, I met the founders of that company in Amsterdam uh, about a year ago. They're really, really interesting to talk to. So 3D Hubs and Shapeways, those are the two different services. You can draft your own stuff for free. Um, SketchUp is a free program. You just download it off the internet uh, and send it to these people and they'll print it out for you. Another platform that I find really helpful is uh, called makeprintable.com. So if you're just getting started uh, and you got a lot of uh, sloppy drawings that, um, you know, have... Uh, reversed faces and, and uh, um, double joints and that kind of thing. Uh, that software platform you can just upload again for free and it'll uh, optimize it for 3D printing. So just keep uh, all of that in mind. Uh, you don't need to make that investment if you don't want to. There's a question about cheap printers. Uh, are they worth it? If you're printing the occasional part, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a great way to get started. You know, um, if you're going to print a lot, if you need a high volume, if you need a different product uh, or a different material, they're not going to work for you. Um, this really is a case of getting what you pay for. Um, you can get a lot of 3D printers out there that are kind of kits uh, and you put them together yourself. Uh, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you'll save a lot of money. You're going to have to work through calibration issues and getting it all put together. 
but certainly a very viable option uh, there as well. So there you go, we covered a lot. Um, well, I can field a few questions here, uh, general questions. Um, how do you seal your sub best? I'm assuming you're talking about the watertight uh, compartment because uh, again, this boat, for example, is gonna be free flooding. You can imagine how heavy this would be if it was sealed off and I had to put weight in there to have it sink or become neutrally buoyant. Uh, I mean, that thing would weigh like 400 pounds. I'd never be able to move it. So the only thing that stays dry is the uh, actual watertight cylinder. You can see the beginnings of it right here. This is going to be a five inch diameter uh, watertight cylinder. Uh, B3 sections, aft section, ballast tanks, and then a forward section that's going to have some other cool stuff uh, in it. But uh, to seal it off, like these again, these are all 3D printed um, bulkheads. Use a uh, series of O-rings. This is uh, similar to the OTW system in that it seals on the face of the watertight cylinder. So um, again, taking a look at the OTW module, you can see the um, O-ring sandwiched between the bulkhead and the cylinder. Uh, and then these brass rods protrude from the outside. You screw it down and it, and it um, compresses the cylinder in there. It's an exceptionally good way to do it. The other way is to seal on the inside face. This is what uh, Dave Merriman has done in his design. So you can see he's got a double O-ring seal that seals on the inside face of the watertight cylinder. So that's two different ways of sealing it. The other thing um, that I've seen is uh, a bayonet seal. Uh, Germans like to use that. Uh, it requires a lot of machining. Uh, but uh, that's another way to do it. And it's a quick um, install and out and um, to take apart and put together. This is a, a, an example of a bayonet system. This is, uh, I think it's called Valterra sewer pipe for RVs. It looks like a watertight cylinder, doesn't it? Um, but you got all these different end caps uh, and stuff. I don't even know if they make them anymore. I got a ton of these I bought um, earlier on, but you can see as you tighten it down, it compresses and there's a seal uh, on the inside there. So that's another way uh, of doing it. These are bulletproof. I, I would bet these are probably watertight to like 50 feet. I would not be surprised at all. Um, and then of course the other way that some of the old school people like to um, put together is the dry hull submarine. Now this was originally built as a dry hull submarine. So you can see, well, we got a compartment in here. It's completely sealed. Uh, we got some hold down studs on there. So you'd put a lid on that and it would compress a seal around the top. So the entire area inside would remain dry. Uh, and every time you want to get in and out, taking off screws. You talk about like the angle boats, like the, the old Typhoon, um, the old Akula, you know, all of those dry hull boats. I, I built a few of those, man. It would take like 15 minutes just to take the lid on and off. Uh, it works, but holy man, is it ever a lot of work. Um, there's a question. How do you screw back the dive planes and the rudders to the rods? You know, we can probably touch on that um, a little bit later on. I use magnetic connectors. That I sell them on my website. You can see them in the RC component section. They just snap together uh, magnetically. I don't have any handy here. Well, I do. I do. I lied. So these are small versions that Merriman put together. They call them click-ons. Uh, I've continued the uh, tradition of calling them that way. You can see they click together like that. So one end obviously comes out of your watertight cylinder. The other side connects to your linkages uh, and they just snap together. Now you can use, um, you know, mechanical uh, linkages as well to keep everything together. I like the magnetic ones. Typically uh, in our applications, you don't have a lot of force trying to draw them apart. And of course, pushing them together isn't uh, an issue. So I sell them in two different sizes, the big size and the little size, the big ones will hold a lot of weight, you know, a few pounds, uh, before it breaks and it makes installation of your cylinder, uh, exceptionally easy. Um, question about brushless motors. 
I mean, they're great, but uh, they're typically exceptionally high RPM. Uh, and you put an exceptionally high um, RPM shaft in a seal, you're going to wear that seal out very, very quickly. So you need to gear it down. Now, all on top of everything else, you've got a gearbox going inside. I'm all about the KISS principle. Keep it simple. There is nothing wrong with a brushed motor. I don't know why people have such a hard on for brushless motors. The brush motors were perfectly fine. They're operating at the RPM range that you want. You have no need for a gearbox and uh, you just put it straight out of the back. Do you want to use a brushless motor? Go ahead. I wouldn't. Budget watertight cylinder. <laughs> Budget watertight cylinder, you're gonna get um, you know, what you pay for. I think I tried pricing out you know, all of the components uh, of a watertight cylinder, trying to see how it would compare to a professional one. Um, you know, especially if you want a clear one, you know, these sections of, of polycarbonate are not cheap um, you know, to begin with, and then all of the electronics uh, and everything in there add up. Um, you know, those of us who are in the ho this hobby to manufacture these things for you guys, we are not going to retire. Trust me, there, there is not enough profit uh, in these to make it a, a worthwhile endeavor in that particular, um, uh, to, to, to put those together for you. You're going to probably end up paying a couple hundred or three hundred dollars more. Value your time. Put a value on your time, Okay. If you put together a watertight cylinder and it takes you 40 or 50 hours uh, and it doesn't work because of a way that you have it configured and you have to start over again, now you're at another, say, 90 or 100 hours total to put into it, um, plus potentially losing your boat and the electronics that you've sunk in the bottom of the pond. Is it worth it to you for a couple hundred bucks? If you got the experience, do it. Lots of people do an exceptionally good job. If you're just starting out, do not go budget. Don't. I've been there. I've done that. It is not worth it. That is my advice. Take it with a grain of salt. I sell these things. Yes, I have a vested interest in selling you cylinders. If you're just starting out, don't try and reinvent the world. Save up your money. Buy a pre-made cylinder. I don't even care if it's for me. Buy it from somebody else. They've been engineered, they've been tested, they've been trialed, and they're going to work for you. And uh, I know too many people that have got frustrated with a hobby and quit because of the problems that they had. Uh, which would, submarine would you recommend as the first one? Um, I would say probably our Blueback Kit uh, is a really, really good option. It's a full uh, static diving version going to be a little bit more expensive than the plastic uh, kits, but you've got a fiberglass hull designed for RC operation. Uh, take a look at it there. I sell a starter kit that includes everything that you need, including some pretty wicked uh, instructions that I'll be finishing up here this weekend or first part of uh, next week. That'll be out there step-by-step walkthrough uh, to allow you to construct the boat from the very beginning all the way through to trimming, getting it in the water. So Highly recommend the Blueback kit. It's a 96 scale. It's a beautiful size. Um, I'm going to leave it open here for just like maybe five more minutes for any other questions that uh, you guys might have. Uh, and then we'll be signing off. I'll scroll through and see what I missed here. Angle Typhoon or Akula as a medium level builder. Yeah, uh, you know those, um, they, they've actually got decent instructions, the angle boats, and they're highly engineered. Uh, I like them a lot. I've built uh, two Akulas and three Typhoons uh, in my time, and uh, they're amazing boats. For a first time builder, I would not recommend it. They're, there's a lot of complication there's a lot of electronics um, and it gets highly frustrating when you get um, issues uh, sorting out your electronics. So uh, if you built an RC sub before and you're looking for uh, you know, a more intense project to try yourself out on, 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, that angle typhoon or the angle of Kula might be a good way to uh, go for you. Um, have you tried building a piston tank with a 3D printer? I have not. Um, you know, certainly it's out there. Piston style ballast tanks uh, have benefits and drawbacks. Um, the, the drawback to them is that you need a lot of room in a watertight cylinder uh, because you need not only the room for the tank, but you need to have room for that shaft to extend all the way out. Um, if you got the room, they're great. So you look at the angle boat, they've got nothing but room because it's a big dry hulled uh, boat. But when you're talking about smaller boats, um, I'm not a big fan of piston style uh, cylinders. Would I print everything? No. Um, you're talking about a lot of pressure uh, and you need some high degree of tolerance. You're going to be talking about machining. Uh, when you're talking about machining, uh, I would say you're probably better served to buy a pre-made system from like RC Sub Workshop or Engel uh, so that you've got something that uh, is highly engineered to strict tolerances and uh, will get you going uh, right away. Question about uh, a ABS bulkheads. Um, yeah, th this is ABS plastic <clears throat> right here. It's what I'll be using in my um, Type 21. There's no reason that you can't 3D print those parts. It works exceptionally well. You might want to uh, make sure that your seal surfaces are perfectly smooth by maybe applying a coat of thin epoxy on there so that it's perfectly smooth and you don't have any ridges uh, to allow water through. One more question. Saddle ballast tanks. That's something that I haven't uh, actually played with. Um, so the old um, you know, U-boats uh, had saddle tanks and that were basically on the outside of the, the boat running along the uh, length uh, of the submarine. So what you've got to watch with for that um, is that both tanks fill and empty at the exact same time. So you need to make sure that your plumbing uh, is applicable for that. Um, you know, again, with the fact that most submarines are very, very long and very, very narrow, Utilizing a, a saddle tank uh, is not really necessary for the most part. You can typically add, um, you know, a, a large central ballast tank right in the middle, back to the KISS principle. Um, one ballast tank, one valve, you know, it's what you're looking for to keep a very simple boat. If you put it at the right part of your boat so that you've got, um, you know, uh, proper center of buoyancy, uh, you're going to have a bulletproof system that you aren't going to uh, need to worry about. Um, last question, guys. Fore and aft uh, trim tanks. I have played with those before. Uh, tons of different ways of doing that. You can have both tanks filled uh, approximately halfway and you run a pump in the middle with a simple speed controller and it can pump uh, water forward and back in there. That's a manual system. Um, you can play around with actually running uh, an automatic pitch controller going to the electronic speed controller that should um, automatically adjust your trim. I haven't played with it a lot. And again, I'm just telling you as a simple system, if you've got a central ballast tank and you've got a properly trimmed boat, there is no need, no need for you to have forward and aft trim tanks. I'm telling you that right now. Any properly trimmed boat is going to behave just fine without the need for fine trim control. So that is my opinion. Uh, take it or leave it. Um, I am going to let you guys go. I do not want to uh, ex overextend my welcome uh, in your homes. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you have any suggestions about what you would like me to talk about uh, in the future, let me know. I think what I'm going to focus on next time, because I've had a ton of questions about it, uh, is electronics, the various electronic modules that are out there, um, how they are connected, what they do. Um, so we'll touch on that uh, next time. Be about a month from now, the first part of April-ish. Uh, hope to see you guys then. 
Uh, again, comments and feedback, I would love to hear. Email me anytime, bob at rc-sub.com. Thanks for joining me, and we will catch you guys next time.